Well, good afternoon, investors. Welcome to the October 20th edition of Bull Sessions coming to you from crisp southeastern Michigan. Is it crisp up in the mid-Michigan area, Ken? Yeah, it's crisp. All of our uh, nasturtiums and dahlias and uh, tender flowers have disappeared from the gardens now. And in fact, Natalie was out there uh, putting them all in barrels and hauling them down to the forest because uh, they are they are nothing but mulch now. So <laughs> the uh, circle yeah. of life. Yep, it's, the, garden uh, the, the gardens look a lot different, but uh, it's just the way it goes when you reach late October in mid Michigan. All right, and I do expect that we'll be joined by Hugh perhaps in a few minutes. My name is Mark Robertson. I am founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing, and we simply do this kind of as a weekly informal uh, discussion of stuff that we see going on. We've got really good stuff this afternoon with respect to a couple of our favorite holdings, but I'm joined here by our dear friend and, again, investor, raconteur extraordinaire, Ken Kabula. Say hello, Ken. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you. And it's, Mark, uh, I just uh, note that every week that we do this, our audience gains another two or three people. Uh, this is the first time that we've been uh, at 40 or better uh, at the beginning of a session. So I'm I'm very pleased at that. That doesn't include the three of us in the back room. So yeah, uh, it's it's really nice to see that. And we also uh, have like a 95% attendance rate. If you say you're coming, you show up. So that's a really good thing too. Yep. And we do get quite a few views uh, in the, from the recorded sessions on the YouTube channel. So that's a good thing. And Kim Butcher is also with us in the back room. Good morning. I, I suspect Florida is treating you better weather-wise. Nah, we're going to have rain all week, but it's not a hurricane, so I don't care. Yeah, but when it's 70 degrees, that's different than 30 and 40 degrees. No, I think it's even warmer than that. It's it's <laughs> actually muggy with high humidity that you walk outside and you go, oh, I'll stay in the air conditioning. Yeah, our daughter's in Tampa, and we forbid her from t actually mentioning the weather to us. So, all right, well, let's go ahead and get it underway. It is October. It's our annual hunt for small companies. We'll be talking about that in a minute. I went searching for a picture of a red bull, and that's what I ended up with. Not sure if I like it or not, but he's there on the page. And Ken was already foreshadowing, talking about the flowers on his patio and deck. Uh, Going to make sure Ken is aware of a contest that he's in, because I don't think he was aware of it until now that he and I are in a run for the roses. And uh, uh -oh. thought we would <laughs> thought we would cover that here this afternoon. And courtesy of National Geographic and Susan Machelik out of Janesville, Wisconsin, that would be a COVID bull on the right. So, sticking with the bullish theme, I I will celebrate something today, Mark. Uh, uh, we went last night. Uh, we had a a meeting of uh, the Mid Michigan Model Club. There's about 24, 25 of us in that club, and we looked at our uh, stock pickers contest. And uh, we had just become so used to one entry below the benchmark that we didn't even notice until the very end that the benchmark was actually the lowest portfolio in the entire uh, contest. Ooh. And even that, even that one entry had suddenly taken a big rise up about eight or 10 places. Uh, I think it was called Mark's Manifest. Oh, entry. really? Uh, yeah, so you're, you're no longer below the benchmark. You're no longer in last place. Even. You're, you're quite a ways up the list. Now. Oh, man. You so, uh, 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 be deep. So, I had it headed for the leaderboard, but I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to I'm going to uh, jinx you real good right now by talking about it. But uh, uh, it that's the first time I can ever remember that every single entry in the contest is above the benchmark uh, that we've been using. We're certainly going to have some fun talking about that in approximately a month, well, three weeks, right? Yes. All right, yes. we'll get the legal paperwork out of the way. No investment recommendation is intended whatsoever. This is an educational demonstration. Everything we do is for illustration, education, and the powerful word demonstration. Uh, we are demonstrating methods and techniques of the modern investment club movement, and opinions are our own. We may hold stakes in some of the companies we talk about. In fact, we're going to do a water water cooler high five about at least one of them here in a few minutes. 
we do do a monthly roundtable. Um, we're a week out from the October roundtable. Um, it's a, a stock picking session of just friends coming together to pick stocks. We've been doing it for now 10 and a half years. The return just touched on 18% per year. Uh, thanks to that one stock we're going to be talking about in a minute. If you'd like a reminder of the roundtable um, to be added to the reminder mailing list, it's an email list. Send an email to nkabula1 at comcast.net. If you have any requests or comments or we need a copy of the slides, please send me a note at markr at manifestinvesting.com. All right, our agenda's gotten fairly busy, so that's kind of why I wanted to do a little lightning round. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, we do this on Tuesday afternoons. A lot of times it's just uh, to share some of the stuff that I'm seeing in the current weekly data refreshing update. But um, many of you have brought us topics. Many of them are listed there. And I thought we would just knock out a few of these. We keep revisiting the projected return on value. We're gonna spend another moment with it, helping to uh, increase our understanding. Uh, we do wanna remind you about the cancellation conference you know, November 11th through the 13th. We are gonna add a little feature to the end of a few of, on, of our next few sessions here at Bull Sessions, our favorite books on investing. And uh, I think that's gonna be some fun and lead to some interesting discussions, but you can just kind of scroll down the topics. We will be covering them and uh, we're gonna squeeze out a few. And I, I'm gonna just do Ken and Mark's run for the roses to get that out of the way here today. Any comments or questions? Uh Mark, I, I have a question from Carmen. She wants to know, how can she join or listen to the Mid-Michigan Model Club meetings? Uh, Carmen, if you send me an email uh, asking for our meeting number, uh, I'll be glad to send you that meeting number back and then uh, welcome you to listen to one or two or three of the club meetings. Uh, we don't entertain members from outside the Mid-Michigan area. If you happen to live outstate Michigan, anywhere except the metropolitan area, then you're in the mid-Michigan chapter already, and we'd be glad to entertain you as a member. But if you're not in that geographic area, we're not uh, going to uh, allow people to join us from outside that area, uh, mainly because of tax purposes. We're not quite sure of what the tax laws are outside the state of Michigan. We do know that some states have uh, penalties and some states have filing requirements and we don't want to put ourselves in that position but send me an email Carmen uh, it's kkavula1 at comcast.net k-k-a-v-u-l-a-1 at comcast.net ask for the number of the mid-michigan model club we have six model clubs in our chapter, so make sure you ask for the Mid-Michigan Club, and I'll send you that number, and you can join us on the third Monday of the month at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Cool. Well, I think Hugh has joined us in the back room, so welcome, Hugh. He might be still unmuting. Hey, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're fine. Good afternoon. Perfect. Sir. Hello. It's still good morning, uh, right? Loud and clear, yeah, Hugh. Sure. Yeah, loud and clear. Excellent. All right, let's go ahead and press on. Got a busy schedule here today. Just a quick note about the Japanese thing we talked about a few weeks ago. We'll probably cover this in greater detail, including the article by Ben Carlson that was featured at Manifest a little bit ago. But this just shows the severity of what we were talking about uh, going back to the 1980s in Japan and uh, that stock market took quite a quite a massive hit going from nearly 43,000 on the Nikkei down to uh, under 7,000 at one point. And then it, it did have a fairly robust gain over the last uh, five to 15 years ago. But I do point out that from that point down towards the bottom there to the current day, which is actually flattened out again, kind of flatlined, we're only talking about a 7 or 8% annualized return from between those two red circles. So it's not like we missed anything dramatic, at least not yet, on a, on a collection of stocks like that. So just kind of an Mark, interesting is that, thing. Is that deep uh, depression there on the second uh, half circle, is that COVID for Japan? 
Mm, no, I, I do, there's actually no data in here for, you know, the last couple of years. Okay, so I wonder what, what happened there. Uh, I don't know, a quarter inch be, be, before the end of the graph where it take, took quite, quite a dive down to around 16,000. That could be the end of 2018. We can look at that in more detail later. But again, it's it's quite a quite an interesting. Is that when their looking. nuclear reactors got flooded? Could be, could be. So we'll dig in a little bit deeper. All right, here, here's one of your memory devices. Successful investing to our conference that uh, we'll be putting on between the 11th and the 13th. More more information to follow. In a few minutes, that happens to be a, a picture taken from the shores of Lake Michigan in the, on the lower peninsula, somewhere in the Traverse City area. Good, clean fun. I, I will tell you that a mailing went out to our entire guest list uh, late last week. So uh, many of you probably received the information about this conference now. If you didn't receive the information, you can go to the Mid Michigan page. Uh, we're part of the Better Investing page. If you go to betterinvesting.org uh, and then look for chapters and then look for MidMichigan, you'll find all the information on the second conference. Our first conference was back in May, uh, three days of, of classes, and this one will be November 11th, 12th, and 13th. Uh, they're all in the uh, mid to late afternoon. Uh, so all the information's there, and for those of you that can't make them in person, uh, we'll have them all posted on the Manifest YouTube site uh, after the conference is over, uh, so you will get a chance to take a look at them. If you're interested in the May conference classes, they're already up on that Manifest uh, YouTube site. All you have to do is look for Manifest Investing or Roundtable. And uh, that'll take you to the correct YouTube site. And then once you're there, uh, we're looking for the COVID Cancellation Conference 1 or Successful Investing 1. And uh, you should be able to find what we did in May. Uh, we're going to repeat ourselves, and I hope we're going to come to, to have classes that are equally popular and equally interesting for you to listen to. So, Ken, how many days do I have to hang on to stay ahead of the benchmark? When it went uh, close down our, the result. Our, our, conf our co contest, uh, the Stock Pickers Contest, which is the basis for one of the classes in the in the conference, uh, ends on Halloween, ends on the 31st. So ah. you have to stay there through the 30th, Mark, because the 31st is a no trade day. All right. So uh, through the 30th, and and you, if you can stay above there, then you know you. You will have uh, ended up ahead of people. You're ahead of the Mid Michigan Model Club. We noticed that we are the last club on the entire list before you get to the benchmarks. So, all right, I'm. I'm we're, not, we're not having strong. a very good year either. <laughs> feeling strong. I'm feeling like a strong finish. All right. All right. That's a great segue, because there's another thing we do that runs from Halloween to Halloween every year. It's our selection of the best small companies. And Ken, I realize I don't have. 100% permission to talk about this in public yet because last year we, I kind of jinxed us. Yes, you did. I know. We still, and I'm, we still beat I'm, the benchmark. I'm, I'm holding my breath right now to <laughs> for what's going to happen in the next week and a half now that you've talked about it. So. All right. We'll do it. We'll do it quietly. But as, as a Bill Wright was mentioning, biospecifics technology took a pretty good jump and it's now beating the market by 66%. Uh, since last Halloween, and that has has given us a really nice boost. We were we're running about four or five percentage points ahead, and now we're here. So I, I think even even with uh, do I dare say anything more about it? Let's just leave no, it. I, at, let's let's, let's no. just leave it at. Let's just leave it at that. Just leave it at I, that. I, I will indicate that I'm a little bit disappointed that uh, that we're not plus uh, in the relative return column that we have uh, more losers than we have winners, uh, albeit we have some really good winners, uh, which maybe makes the point that you don't need to hit very many home runs uh, to keep your portfolio well above water. 
So uh, with, with all that in mind, uh, I, I really would love to see that relative return column have half or more green numbers in it. But so, uh, I'll, I'll take whatever it gives us. What I'd like to see is a, a bunch of you in the audience get out there and buy some CyberArk software. You can sell it next month. I don't care, but get out there and push the price up on ticker symbol CYBR so that we get one more out of the red. But uh, Ken actually makes a really good point. Um, when you look at Etsy, which, by the way, is a stock that, you know, if I'm looking at this list a year ago, I would I was really not comfortable with Etsy. Ken probably remembers that pretty well. Well, that 230%, that's a gain of 130% year over year. And that basically absorbs every single one of these, if you do the math. It offsets every single one of those, if you, if you just stack them up and add them up. And uh, that's how this stuff works when you're investing in these type of companies. Um, Cantel Medical on, is on here. It has actually lost ground for the third straight year in this contest, in this uh, best small companies listing. So, Ken, if it shows up on the list this year, I don't know what we're going to do with it. Well, we've uh, we've already brought it to our attention that that we're we're not in love with Cantel Medical. Maybe maybe four years the charm, huh? What do you think? Yeah, well, we, I can remember saying last year, third year will be the charm. So, well, I mean, when a company goes down forty percent, then fifty percent, then thirty percent, I mean, it, at some point, you know, it just gets frustrating. Yeah. But maybe it's their year next year. Good stuff. Well, this is what Bill Wright was talking about. Um, and perhaps you can give us some background on Endo, if he knows a little, anything about the company or has ever dealt with them. But they actually are acquiring Biospecifics. Uh, it's a four-time selection for the roundtable in addition to being among the best small companies. It's uh, also in 10 Cup. We'll show that in a minute. Um, well, I did. Mark, I, can, I can give you some information on Endo. Endo was Biospecifics partner in everything biospecifics did with collagenase. Uh, and collagenase was the one discovery that biospecifics was kind of riding uh, with a number of products. Uh, the two major products that biospecifics had, uh, the only uh, way that biospecifics uh, remained involved with those two products was to get royalties from the sale of those products and the royalties came directly from Endo. So it looks to me like Endo just got tired of paying royalties and decided to just buy the company. Yeah, and apparently the the cash flow and the, the revenue stream and the solutions provided to customers have been pretty good. And well, and, and I think that second last sentence on the on this slide right here, uh, which was the approved uh, injectable treatment for cellulite might have sealed the deal. That was yeah. going to belong to Biospecifics, and that was going to be a product marketed by Biospecifics, not by Endo. Endo was not going to have any... Uh, any tie to that product at all mm -hmm. and that might have been what tipped it uh so that endo said we we're just going to pull this company into our pasture of of what we already own and the hue do you have any background or any color you can add to this any experience with these guys i don't i'm afraid it seems more of a <clears throat> i i know endo and know of endo and it's you know it's, it's a growing company but i really put it in the category of a specialty pharma company rather than a novel company. It doesn't have a novel pipeline. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it has been selected twice by the audience. That won't hurt a bit that yeah. those, this transaction will end up on the all-time um, best leaderboard when it's done. Um, I selected it once and Ken Kavula also selected it once for the round table. So good stuff. All right, it's also a resident of Tin Cup, our model portfolio at Manifest Investing, and it has shot up to uh, $300,000 in value. It's now 10, almost 11% of the portfolio, as you can see here. And uh, as Bill was mentioned, Bill Wright was mentioning, the par is down in that 5%-ish range, which says that Endo is actually getting a pretty good deal. You know, normally a, a buyout of this type uh, will often require a, a zero or negative par to really pull it off. So uh, those are almost Warren Buffett type numbers. 
So it, it's actually uh, pumped up 10 cup quite well, almost uh, up to $3 million. And it's here that uh, I let Ken in on the secret contest that he's in. Um, a few months ago, he, he recommended First Financial all over the place. Well, not, not recommended, but you know what I mean. Uh, he has an infatuation with First Financial, and I needed to put a, a financial stock in the 10 cup portfolio. And I basically took $100,000 that was available and split it between these two, Great Southern Bank Corp. So it's Great Southern Bank Corp for me, racing against First Financial for Ken. So $50,000 into each one, and then, you know, the race is just getting underway. But uh, this is this is a race that I can't hide from, Ken. That's a pretty close race there right now, too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll let it run as long as they continue to be solid residents of Tin Cup and and uh, Mark, where where does Great Southern Bank Corp center itself? Do you know? I'm pretty. Sh I I actually don't know. I I think it's down in uh, Oklahoma and and southeastern area. But I don't know. One of the things that I really liked about it, uh, I mean, you have to get a lot of things right with First Financial, and I, there's no reason to expect that they won't. But the PE projected PE for Great Southern's only nine, so right. That PE has expanded quite a bit uh, in the years that I've owned First Financial. It's a long-term holding of mine. Uh, it's also held by a number of the investment clubs that I belong to. Uh, what I like about First Financial is just its geography and the where it's centered, and it's centered uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. With uh, uh, they don't call them branches; they call them centers because they actually operate as 13 different banks, and they're in 13 different places throughout Texas. But the the main uh, coordinating body that coordinates all these centers is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and I just I, I really like the growth that's going on right there. Uh, I didn't realize how how robust the growth was in that part of Texas until uh, I started looking at some of the slides that come from First Financial Bank Corps talking about population growth in different areas of the country. Um, First Financial, uh, I can't speak for Great Southern, but First Financial does a, a really fine job of putting uh, together investor presentations for investor information. So if you're interested in the audience there, I'd go to their website and, and take a look at what they're what they have there to, to give you a gander at. So there you have it. At some point in the future, I'll declare the race to be over and, and we'll put a, a wreath of roses around one of us. I'm surprised you're not doing that today since you're ahead, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, when, when you're in control of the accounting, you, you don't have to worry quite so much about that sort of thing. All right. So here here we go. This is the kind of an up-to-date list of uh, stocks that show up with returns, uh, excuse me, growth rates greater than 12%, uh, decent quality pretty much across the board with a couple clinkers in there but uh, fairly high manifest rank and fairly decent character characteristics across the board, but these are actually ranked by projected return on value. So double digit projected return on value, just wanted to see who would bubble to the top. These are the type of companies that Ken and I will be arm wrestling over here in the next few days. In fact, Ken, we need to set a time and start crunching on that. So we will we do certainly that. do. I'm, I'm so happy that that MHO mark that, that I sent to you, you you included now in the database and it's made the list. I'm really happy about that. I've been kind of uh, digging deep into that one for my own personal portfolio. Uh, that's about six or seven down the list. It's a home builder. Right. And I, I think uh, that one will be a yeah. good challenge with LGI Homes is also on the list here. And we were yep. pointing out in the green room, there's a couple of Malibu boats is on here as long with Mastercraft. I don't think they both survive and make the list. So maybe a little challenge action there. But there's some interesting names on here that uh, could do quite well. What any current thinking on Inogen from any of the four of any of the three of you? INGN, it's kind of in the middle of the chart well, there. I brought it to a couple conferences on the strength of of my own doctor saying that it's one of the plays uh, that he felt was was a really hot play. Uh, but the performance of Inogen has not lived up to the hype of Inogen. So maybe it's proving my doctor is not much of a stock picker or 
or maybe it's proving something else. I'm not sure. But that's about all I can tell you on Inogen. I don't know. Hugh or Kim, do you know anything about the company at this point? Not me. No, I don't. I'm just looking at it right now. I mean, the concept to me is extremely, you talk about a, a story that makes a lot of sense. That For those of you that are not familiar with the company, it, they make the small, almost fanny pack type oxygen units for people who need uh, an oxygen yeah. tube. And uh, there are people who believe that these small devices will actually replace the tanks and the O2 systems in hospital buildings at some point. That's how powerful the potential could possibly be. Well, it also, Mark, has the 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 possibility of wiping out a, uh, a fairly large niche industry, and that's these people that fill oxygen tanks and then go around to homes and deliver them. Right. Uh, that, uh, that's a pretty robust, uh, small, smallish kind of industry that Inogen has the power to, to completely replace uh, <laughs> with these uh, units that actually make the oxygen right there with with just a little bit of electricity so so i i see it as a pretty good vertical integration play to have uh hughes apple watches with their o2 sensors and then inogen yeah. as kind of a package deal but i would I, i'd imagine that if it's going to be a threat it's going to get taken up by an air key to one of these gas companies you know sure all right. So I think I think price is standing in the way right right now, Mark. And and uh, yeah. when I was in the discussion with my doctor, he did indicate that that from as far as he knew, this wasn't getting any reimbursement from anybody uh, to to buy the unit. So it wasn't being encouraged by Medicare, or Medicaid, or any of those big uh, government entities, uh, which would greatly boost the product uh, if if in fact they got into the game yeah that makes it um, very very elective as a yeah. solution then absolutely yeah. all right so that's that's just a quick update of some of the companies we'll be going through i expect a handful of these companies to make our list for 2021 our friend diane grace uh says that uh she and her siblings bought one for her mom and everybody loved it. Uh, all we had to do was pack some extra batteries, and she was able to fly overseas. Excellent. So that, uh, that's an interesting uh, kind of an idea as well, that it, it not only gives you mobility around town, but it allows you to go almost anywhere you want to go with a, a supply of batteries. Cool. All right, so let's go ahead and segue into a topic that the audience is really – kind of intrigued by and Ken and I have been intrigued by this for a number of months projected return on value enterprise value to be specific but you can see a couple of the notes there that explains our interest in this parameter and by the way that's what this sort was based on this uh, column right here projected return on value and you can see the calculation right here it's literally just accounting for the expectations of pre-tax income projected pre-tax income you could could use cash flow the number to be slightly higher but it'd be uh, fairly similar for many companies uh, but basically taking that expectation and dividing by the price you pay for the investment and then also accommodating or being cognizant of their total liabilities that used to be long-term debt we discovered that if you switch it to total liabilities you become immune to some of the gymnastics by accounting and what i mean by that is you know leases and capital leases and all kinds of bizarre ways of recharacterizing owing people money and so the total liabilities is you just owe somebody something and i'm then accounting for also the cash on hand in the company checkbook so that's the calculation and uh, we've been kind of intrigued by it and ken i thought i would just offer up this image and uh this kind of explains it in in a visual way for what we're talking about we're talking about buying an asset in this case striker and what we're looking at here is that uh comparison on the front side the visual analysis of a stock selection guide 
and we're looking at that five-year projected pre-tax income, it's not something we typically pay a lot of attention to when we're doing a traditional stock selection guide, but we're basically comparing that number that is right here. And keep in mind that that number is basically the average of what's expected from this company for the next 10 years. So the way Greenblatt explains it is it's kind of like the rent if you're buying a rental property. And the the amount of rent actually can tell you an awful lot about the purchase price that you'd be willing to pay for a rental property. So if you think of Stryker as the rental property and that cash flow or pre-tax income as the annual rent average over the next 10 years, it starts to put this context, at least in my opinion, in a little better better perspective. What are your thoughts, Ken? Well, Mark, I have a, a question. Why is that giving us a 10-year number there? Because, you know, if you're looking out at a five-year projection, uh, what that number would basically represent, it's the way that Greenblatt and others talk about it, that you think about owning a rental property for the next 10 years and a certain amount of rent, monthly rent, you know, perhaps escalating with inflation over time. Anyhow, there's an average number. And... Uh, <clears throat> That's that's basically what you're looking at, the average 10-year pre-tax income. Okay, so that's why your dotted line is extending five more years right. past the very large dot then. Right. Okay, so, you know, so, so if you think of that as, a, as, a, as an old-fashioned teeter-totter, uh, that's at the fulcrum of the teeter-totter. It's halfway there, or like you said, it's the average of the, of the two endpoints. Okay. Right, so you're looking at that, that point – you know, that forecast point compared to the price you pay. So obviously, if the stock price, which has actually done extremely well for Stryker lately, um, as that goes up, as the stock price goes up, obviously the, the projected return on value goes down because it's in the denominator. Now, Mark, would this be, would the calculation itself be based on trailing 12 months or would it be based on the last piece of annual data? Well, we always build out a five-year forecast from, you know, wherever we're at. So it would be, for us, it's always going to be a five-year pre-tax, projected pre-tax income. From the, from the last annual dot or from the last quarterly dot though? We would always be going from the last quarterly dot. Okay. So, uh, we might want to pick that line up and move it uh, two quarters then to the right. Is that correct? Yeah, but I also always go off trend lines. So, Okay, well, but, but what I'm saying is that this is taking into effect the, the COVID uh, issue that's involved with Stryker here right now. Well, I, I think this trend line is actually deflected down a little bit because of what's going on, if that's what you're asking because of that last quarterly data there, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, and that's what, I, that's what I'm asking is, perhaps the, there is a little the bit of trend a line, bit. yeah. But the thing yeah. I wanted to illustrate with this slide is the, the data point, trying to give a, a vision of what are we actually talking about? We're talking about the projected pre-tax income, just like yeah. we look at for every company versus those other things that are in the denominator. This is a nice visual to add to what we've been doing. Yes, very much so. And again, just to reinforce, this is why we're we're looking at this stuff. Um, it's got the bullet points, the talking points on the right. And again, it's just kind of fascinating to us that we do this without any reliance on PEs. One of the things that Ken and I will be talking about in the sessions coming up uh, in November is this notion of using this analysis to uh, double check or perhaps uh, modify or or uh, it's a, basically a second opinion check on PE assumptions in our in our analysis of companies. And and I think that's one of the most powerful uses of this tool, Mark, is to give us a heads up when we need to be looking at the PEs uh, that may be our, our way out of line from where where this calculation is telling us they should be. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk retail. I know a lot of us don't like to talk retail. I'm not going to do the section that we'll do in the future about retail, but I do want to talk about these guys a little bit. I don't know if you caught the news, but Dillard's basically went up 50% a few days ago in one day. 
And the reason it went up is Berkshire Hathaway was discovered to own, I believe, 6.8% of outstanding shares of Dillard's that they had accumulated within the last few months. So what I wanted to do is kind of take a look at the company and just kind of nudge it out there as a thought. I, I've been thinking about companies like this, not necessarily Dillard's, but Kohl's comes to mind, ticker symbol KSS, another one might be TJX, but companies that are basically going through this, you know, for COVID and projected to come out the other side basically unharmed. Look where this earnings number is. And, you know, look at the carnage that has happened to these type of companies. And in fact, Value Line obviously still believes that the car carnage will continue, but uh, Berkshire Hathaway apparently disagrees. But this thing shot up overnight, went from 40 to 60. It's relaxed back down to about 50. But, you know, are there companies out there that would basically be what, um, you know, it's a big garage sale. They're not all distressed merchandise. And I think that there could be some interesting smaller retailers that could be kind of interesting to look at. It's also an, a reminder that uh, we should not be paying so much attention to what Berkshire Hathaway has already bought, but we're basically out there trying to figure out, well, what might they be buying next? And uh, that's how you get ahead in the, in the challenge of investing. And uh, it's actually kind of a Hugh McManus moment where, again, if this company can actually return to you know, those fairly vanilla profitability levels, fairly vanilla PEs, you know, we're looking at some fairly decent returns for this company. Um, so again, what does it look like coming out the other side of the chasm? Um, this number look, was pretty compelling back then. This one is still not too bad, even after the 50% pickup in stock price. So it's just uh, just tossed out there as, Maybe it's a good time to tiptoe into the minefield of retailers and, and give it some thought. What Mark, let me lay out a let me lay out a thesis and see what you think about it. Okay, uh, we we know that analysts travel in uh, packs and that they they tend to overreach it going in both directions. That pendulum tends to swing too far in one direction and then to compensate goes too far in that other direction. Uh, what I'm wondering if a, a lot of the uh, models that analysts are using right now are modeled uh, to show all shopping moving online within the next, and you fill in the blank, 20 years, 30 years, 15 years, uh, whatever it is. And, and I'm not ready to buy that thesis quite yet. Uh, I think that discounts the uh, social aspect of shopping, that discounts the the need for human beings to touch and feel and and uh, discuss different things that they're interested in, and I'm just wondering if uh, there there's a balance point that's maybe not as far towards complete uh, online shopping as the analyst community would like to believe there is, and that leaves a little bit more room then for the. TJX and the Dillards and the Rosses and the Coles of of uh, of the of the community uh, that don't just deal in discount goods like Dollar General or or uh, 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 any of the the discounters, but deals in in goods that you can just as easily buy online. But maybe it's nicer if you want to go out and buy a scarf to to have 20 of them displayed in front of you where you can touch them and feel them and wrap them around your neck and decide which one it is you want. The same for shoes or for almost anything else that, that exists. So my thesis is uh, maybe Buffett, uh, we've always characterized as sitting in a room and just thinking about what the next five years might bring. Uh, maybe he's come to the conclusion that there's a balance point for this online shopping and maybe it's not as close to 100 percent as the analyst community is pegging it at right now yeah i would go for that and then i would i would also say that many of these companies are already hedged a little bit and that they have their own online uh 
option. So they're already out there. They're hedged a little bit. I mean, it's a, uh, I, I do think, I do believe in the overreaction of analysts. Now I'd, I would have, would have had a hard time chasing this one. I'll, I'll show some other long-term trends here in a minute, but uh, it's a, uh, it's an interesting perspective when you think about one of the things that I do know in studying the way that these numbers are all treated again by the analysts, especially the value line analysts, there is definitely a tipping point thing going on. If these guys come in with slightly better results, you know, somewhere in this time frame, you know, in the you know, like the day after tomorrow or whatever, this number can actually get doubled overnight in the in their mathematical models. And it's just something to be aware of. Uh that they're very um uh, well, you said it, Ken. Tipping, it's a tipping point phenomenon. It, it's something to watch for. Mark, Bill Harvey is making the point from our audience that uh, this Dillard's purchase was not a Berkshire investment, uh, but a personal purchase by Ted and Wes, Wet, Weschler, Weckler. Uh, do you know anything about that? Yeah, he's one of the disciples, for sure. Yeah, he was the one mentioned in the article. Yeah, it was not, excuse me, he's right. It was not Berkshire Hathaway specifically. It was a a Berkshire Hathaway advocate and associate. Okay. And that apparently is enough. So as, as soon as Ken, we can make either you or you uh, or Kim a, a Berkshire advocate slash associate, you can move markets <laughs> too. Hey. We can move markets. All right. All right. This, this is another uh, one. I a lot of money when I go to Omaha. I do, but I don't think I'm going to move markets, not the way he does. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think we should do a, a, a test balloon or a trial balloon, Ken. You should come out with some uh, some retailer that we can go crazy over and see what happens in the marketplace. Well, I the only one I'm spending a lot of money in recently, Mark, is Cantoro's Italian Deli. So, <laughs> and I don't think that's a national going concern. So, and and I will also, as as a counterpoint to what you just said, is you ought to see the Amazon boxes on my front porch, Ken. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> All right. And I mean, these are like ten dollar orders. I don't know how they're doing it. Um. Some interesting long-term trends that I think we might take a little closer look at for a company like Dillard's. I was not aware at the rather extreme decline in shares outstanding over time. It might be really interesting to when we talk about buybacks to take a look at their return on investment from a treasury stock perspective. And I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, has that been a, a good thing over time to take a look at? And then the other thing that's to be noticed. And if you do go shopping in the minefield that is retail, I do think it's pretty important that the number of stores appears to have plateaued in the bottom of the trough, and they appear to be aiming to go upward a little bit. In other words, more stores three to five years from now than they currently have. And you can see that they had been in a fairly steady decline, probably shedding some of their less profitable uh, retail outlets over time. So just a few things to look at there. And again, just this notion of, of average slash vanilla expectations for a company and how rewarding that that might possibly be in a, in a deep value situation. Dillard's was quite acquisitive, Mark, at the turn of the century. Uh, I know that they moved into my hometown, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, and ate up all the Higby's stores. Higby's was the large brand in Cleveland at the time, mm -hmm. and every one of them became a Dillard's uh, within a space of, of eight or ten months. So they bought the whole chain out. Yeah, and if, if you read in any of the management chronicles or whatever, they actually get fairly high marks for what they've done. So it would be interesting to dig into it in a little more, especially from a capital allocation perspective. Kim's going to talk about that in a minute. Um, stock search results, looking at Simply the retail industries that we've been talking about here, the only requirement is quality greater than 60 and just some of the higher returns, just in case some of these might trigger some studies. I am not saying run out and buy any of these, but uh, lo and behold, Mastercraft Boat does make the list as it showed up in the small company list. And there could be some interesting companies to, uh, to take a look at 
in those screening results. Again, screening for a retail opportunity that you might not normally do, but uh, again, with a return to anything halfway normal, three to five years out, which seems like a long time from now, but not bad. All right, quick commercial for First Trust's Jim Bowen. He gives the annual keynote at the Fearless Investing Summit. Some of you just loved this one a few years ago when he gave it, and this year he had to give the presentation just like we've been doing with COVID cancellation using Zoom uh, from his home in, well, actually it was his Florida home. Um, he did it just a few weeks ago. It's only 23 minutes. The thing I love about Jim Bowen is he, he, he brings me back to earth. He talks about narratives and data. And there are so many times, and I'm not going to get preachy or political here, but there are so many times when you actually look at the information and the data, it doesn't reconcile with what you're reading in the news. And uh, he points that out again to us, and uh, it's just kind of kind of good to get uh, grounded back in the data and avoid some of those narratives that are floating around out there. So I would encourage you to take a listen to it and tell me if you agree with me or disagree. All right. We're going to start a, a little feature here at the um, at the bull sessions of picking out some books. And I asked everybody that's here this afternoon to name an influential or a favorite investing text. And we'll start with Ken Kabula. Well, uh, I will admit to uh, starting this book uh, when I was maybe 25, 26 years old. And I just couldn't wade through it. It was the original uh, textbook uh, by Benjamin Graham called The Intelligent Investor. And uh, try as I might, uh, I just kept falling asleep before I could get very far on the whole thing and finally just set it aside as, as maybe being uh, above my uh, level of interest and above my uh, level of really wanting to know uh, that much about what he was talking about. Uh, when the book was republished, uh, I don't know, when is the date of republishment? About it's, 2000, something like that, Mark? I, it seems more recent than that. I want to say more like 2010, but... 2003 is the date I have on my, okay. my copy. Yeah, and, and it came out with a significant uh, uh, annotation, I guess is a good word to attach to it, and the annotation was done by a couple of people that I uh, really respected. One of them was Mr. Buffett, uh, and one of them was Mr. Zweig, Marty Zweig, who I had watched uh, during the late 80s and 90s on, uh, on television quite a bit as part of the uh, show of, what was it, what was his program called? Wall Street Wall Review? Week. Wall Street Week. It's actually Wall Street Martin's, Week, right. It's actually Martin's uh, son, Jason. Right, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and uh, I, re I really thought the annotations uh, added a lot to the book. They made it a heck of a lot more readable, and if nothing else, uh, I found the new introduction to the intelligent investor to give me some great uh, uh, attaboys on things I was doing right already, and some some really things to ponder and to think about uh, if if you don't want to read the whole thing, I would suggest that you get the book, the revised book, and you just read the introduction uh, and see what, what our friends have to say about it. Uh, but the entire book, even though the, the original text has not changed, the annotations are there uh, to, to make your mind jump a little bit and to think about what exactly uh, Graham was saying Again, he's he's not the the, the most uh, scintillating writer in the world, but boy, he certainly has great ideas uh, as to why we do what we do. Uh, and I think that everything that that uh, manifest and better investing teach us, uh, I think, come directly from Benjamin Graham. I uh, I know that Nicholson had to have been sitting at the feet of Mr. Graham as he thought about how he was going to teach people how to invest. Yeah, there's definitely a story of Benjamin Graham visiting the University of Michigan while Nicholson was there, and I, I don't have a hard time imagining that there wasn't some uh, influence there. We actually did do a book report. That's probably pretty close. We were just a few years after the release, 2009, 
and I discovered this afternoon that you can actually get the whole book online if you want to take a look at that URL, which I find hard to believe, but that's free. All right, Kim, your favorite book, or your, at least your favorite book for this week. Uh, yes, this is my favorite book for this week. Um, when I joined Better Investing, I really loved the idea that you could double your money every five years. But, you know, what can you say? Personality and greed takes over. This book talks about how you can be a stock market genius if you understand some of those restructurings and mergers and, for me, spinoffs. They've been... Uh, I think in my portfolio currently over 50% of my stocks in my portfolio are spinoffs. And I can confirm that you really can double your money in three years. There's a few things that you really, that are, uh, what do you say, red asterisks right next to it when you have to look at it? Because there is a, a checklist in here mm -hmm. that, um, that they talk about. And even more importantly, uh, if anybody wants to find this book, Put that in Google and then put PDF after it. It might be an earlier version of the book, but you can find it. Okay. Um, that big red letter thing is, especially after what's going on right now, um, follow the debt. When you have a company that's going to spin off, it's one of their divisions that's a, a, a stepchild that they don't want anymore. They do have a tendency to spin off something and they might laden it up with debt. Or uh, in the case I can tell you with PayPal, PayPal spun off from eBay. First time I ever saw it where they gave uh, PayPal $500 million to help make sure that they were successful. So um, this book has got lots of yellow marks in it. Uh, I've done lectures on it, and I would highly suggest that you have this uh, within your library to um, have uh, some reading because, you know, I didn't realize with all that John Malone as the cable cowboy, he has all kinds of rights offerings and recapitalizations, and it, it explains it all to you, and it's in very clear terms. So this is the one I like. Well, good stuff. Yeah, and in, in fact, the projected return on value concept is embedded in this book, so it's definitely worth it from that perspective. And Kim is, uh, is touching on areas of confusion, which dovetails perfectly with Ken's comments earlier about the pendulum swinging too far in either direction. They create some confusion with some of these uh, capital restructurings, and there can be opportunity created in those moments. I, I will never forget as long as I live the restructuring at Qualcomm back in the mid 1990s when they discontinued making cell phone headset handsets and uh, simply began to live off the royalties. Wall Street could not figure out that business model for a long time. And uh, we, we were very amply rewarded for our investment in Qualcomm back in those days. Mark, we have a question or comment from Howard, Howard Perry. Howard, uh, I can't unmute you. You have to unmute yourself. You're self-muted, uh, but we'll allow you to speak if you want to unmute yourself. Howard, you'll need to unmute yourself if you want to speak to us. Okay, we'll have to consider that an inadvertent hand, Mark, okay? okay. And Hugh actually wants to do a, a repeat from last week. Go ahead, Hugh. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, I misspoke a little bit on this one. It is not out of print. I actually eventually found it on Amazon. I couldn't find it before, but it's appearing on Amazon and it's reasonably priced under 20 bucks for the uh, paperback edition. And this book goes back to um, the mid 80s, 85 or thereabouts, when Thornton Woodlove wrote it. It's about the quality of earnings and how you can actually investigate the financials of the company in a bit more detail to see if they're gussying things up or putting their best foot forward when they're reporting earnings. And it divides the book into a number of different sections. It, it, it looks at uh, non-typical or extraordinary sources of earnings. Cash flow is dealt with in great detail. 
But the big area, debt as well, as, as was just mentioned, is an important area. The big area is to look at inventory, splitting up inventories into uh, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods, or work in progress and finished goods. See how they move around as the market situation changes and how they correlate with um, sales and with accounts receivable. And that is actually a forecasting tool for maybe good times ahead or bad times ahead. And I think if you harken back to the 1990s that Mark was talking about when it was very hard to know, for example, how things would go with a software company like an Oracle or a Microsoft, but it was very clear when you looked at the inventories of Dell, particularly in 1998, and into 1999, 97 to 99 with Lucent and Cisco and perhaps even Qualcomm, although I don't recall looking at Qualcomm, but certainly Cisco, you could see inventory signal that there were going to be lean times ahead. Uh, and so that was a bit of a warning to investors that maybe the market bubble in uh, software on allthings.com was about to pop. Yeah, it's a very good book, it's a good read maybe a bit heavy in certain places. Um, uh, maybe I'm not as cynical as he would be about what corporate corporations are up to, but it's a very good read to uh, understand a little bit what what the earnings actually mean. Yeah, and one of the things that he was committed to doing is uh, is watching Tesla closely for any, any signs of uh, inventory analysis lessons that can be learned going forward. So well, I look forward to that. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. I'll come back to when it went public in, in uh, 2010. And I, I'm looking at all, all its inventories. It means it looks at raw material, work in process, as it calls it, finished goods. And it has one other component that I'm drawing a blank on now. But spare parts, maybe. But it, it looks at those. And uh, I'm actually downloading all the information on revenues and on uh, receivables just to, just to understand better what was going on with this company at the mm -hmm. time. And they do report earnings tomorrow afternoon, so yeah. perhaps next week we'll have some Tesla thoughts. I'm hoping, yeah. All right. So we're down to my choice. My choice is the Motley Fool Investment Guide. Um, I do actually know these guys personally, Tom and David Gardner. And uh, kind of the thing that gets gets me with this one, I have not looked at the the current version that's shown there on the right. They actually have a third edition that I've not checked out. I did place an Amazon order after discovering that that was out there, so I'll have it here in a couple of days. But uh, the thing I like about The Motley Fool is if you're you're out there and you're relatively new to this stuff, because I think I might have gotten lost in in all of the the heavy jargon and stuff and the, you know, almost the intimidation factor if I look back to the late 1980s, early 1990s when I was trying to figure this stuff out. And these guys are fun. And uh, they're snarky. Uh, sometimes their sense of humor can get a little bit edgy. But they also pointed out that, you know, much like George Nicholson, there's really only a few things you have to care about when it comes to investing in companies. And you can have fun. And uh, they continue to do it to this day uh, at fool.com. But uh, I may not have continued an, an interest in investing without these two guys back in the mid 1990s. And, uh, I look forward to uh, refreshing with that third edition Motley Fool Investment Guide. Hopefully, they didn't get too serious and and sober this time around. Ken, have you uh, are you familiar with the most recent version or any of the uh, not the not the most recent version, Mark? I have uh, the one to the uh, left. I have that on my bookshelf, uh, but I have not seen the most recent version. No. Well, I'll check that one out. Uh, I can certainly look inside it while I'm waiting for my copy to arrive and. Uh, We'll have some fun. But that those are the topics that we had for today. We'll add those four books to our library, and we'll continue doing this in coming months. Just a reminder that if you'd like to be notified anytime we do put uh, these sessions up on the Manifest Investing YouTube page, if you subscribe, you'll get automatic notifications. Please click stuff that you like so that we know what to put in front of you. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, yeah, here's our stock pickers again. Just a reminder, it will be on 11, 12, and 13 of November. Uh, and you can go to the MidMichigan page. Uh, uh, right there is a, uh, uh, a link uh, how to do it. Uh, you can also uh, register for these things on the Manifest Investing right on the front page under Events. 
So yeah, if you're having you trouble on that one, okay, <laughs> work, it's a if work in having, progress, but it'll be there soon. Coming soon. If you're having, near you. And if you're having troubles of any kind, uh, uh, do drop an email to kcavula1 at comcast.net or ncavula1 at comcast.net. Uh, we'd be glad to send you out a, a sheet with all the URLs on it, and that would make it very easy as well to, uh, to register for the conference. It's absolutely free. All you have to do is show up, and we will try as well as we can to entertain and inform. And we'll probably be talking about best small companies, but that's all I'm going to say because I don't want to jinx us. All right. And with that, I'll just say thanks to all of you, and hope, hopefully you in the audience enjoyed. Let us know what's on your mind, and we'll leave you with a picture of the COVID bull as we say goodbye for another week. So thanks, everybody. Good hunting. Bye, everybody. Bring, bring Bye, us, everyone. If you run into good, any good small company ideas, let us know. Now is the time. Thanks, everybody. Mark, we do have just a few questions.